Aye, the composer was in despair. He was struggling to earn a living in London. There were days he couldn't afford to eat. He couldn't afford to, to go or buy a meal. One night in 1741, he, he left his lodgings depressed, lonely. He wandered the streets of London. It was almost dawn when he returned to his shabby little room. On the table was a thick envelope and it was from Charles Jennings, a man who had written his librettos. While examining the pages, George Frederick Handel found them covered with scripture texts. Wearily, he tossed the pages aside and, well, just crawled into bed, like you do when you're knackered and cold and hungry. But he couldn't sleep. The words he had read returned to him. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, says your God. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light, for unto us a child is born. Glory to God in the highest. Alleluia, alleluia. Round and round they went. So disturbed was he, he got up and went to the piano. And there, well there, the music flowed through his hands from his heart. Rich, majestic, triumphant. He began to write night and day for, for three weeks. He, he writes feverishly. If he got to sleep, if he got to feed, if he got to rest, he refused to see anyone. At last, on the day when the work was finished, a friend managed to gain entrance. The composer would visit his piano. Sheets of music strewn around the place and tears running down his face. I do believe, said Handel, I do believe that I have seen all of heaven before me and the great God himself. <laughs> Well, millions of people have been able to believe that, and that's just by listening. The first audience to hear the composition was in Dublin in 1742, and it gave it the longest ovation Dublin has ever heard for anybody's work. A matter of weeks later, London heard it for the first time, and again it was a triumph. The king was there and so impressed during the Alleluia chorus that he, he rose to his feet, so of course everybody else rose to their feet. A custom that still prevails today. When Handel was writing, the earthly power of kings was clear and apparent in most societies. The French Revolution was yet to take place. The crown heads of Europe largely believed in their absolute power. Though the English Civil War saw the stirring of an ultimate and limiting of the notion of the divine rights of kings in the British Isles. Handel was writing from a vision of God, which is clearly rooted in the book of Revelation, where the kings of this world are set out as being subject to the authority and the majesty of God. Even the greatest in the land don't stand beyond that authority. Don't stand beyond that action. God is the beginning and the end. The all-encompassing. He's not just the Alpha and the Omega. He's all the Greek letters in between as well. Revelation 22, 12-13 places us and our actions in the context of the judgments of the God. He is the Alpha, the Creator. Aye, there's always a beginning. The debate, you know, about the Creator God has droned on and on throughout my lifetime between evolutionists on the one hand 
and special creationists on the other. But both take faith, because neither can be proven. To prove something scientifically, it must be both observable and repeatable. Well, so far, as far as I know, no one's managed that. We've observed creation, but we've not been able to repeat it. We've only explored it even down to the detail of dark matter, but we can't create. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, writes St John. That there is a beginning is self-evident. Every even Voltaire, the famous atheist of the 18th century, is quoted as saying, The world embarrasses me and I cannot dream that this watch exists and has no watchmaker. The beginning is God and the end is God in Jesus. It is with this that the book of Revelation draws to a climax. But the whole of the great movement of God through the beginning, middle and end of his work is based upon love that God has for his creation and we are part of it. It's in that love that he acts in coming in Jesus to enable his creation to be with him, to recognise the divine which is in them and with them. He becomes the King of kings, the Lord of lords, so that all may know his love and rule. Well, the trouble is that we who are the creation have the power to refuse that rule because he's given each of us the freedom of will. Time and time again in our living, we crash and burn making a mess of things because we're determined to have our own way. As I say this, the leaders of the nations are mostly gathered together in Glasgow for COP26. By now, you'll know the outcomes of the Conference of the Parties, as it's called. The problem, I suspect, will, will not be the grand promises, however carefully crafted, however carefully worded. But the problem is going to be the actions that follow. How are we, who are privileged in certain countries because of history and the use of the world's resources, going to change our lives so that all may live in his creation with security, health and wholeness? Are we, are we actually prepared to have a lower standard of living so that some may live? In many ways, that is the choice. You know, we look at the idyllic islands of the Maldives or the coral atolls in the Pacific Ocean and think of how great it would be to go there to see. But there could be nowhere to go, nothing to see, if the keeps on, sea keeps on rising. We look with horror as Holmes claps into the North Sea on the coast of East Anglia and have great sympathy. But what will happen when whole villages and towns are swamped by the rising water? London could find itself with water everywhere. The words of sympathy will not be enough. And we're going to all have to face how we translate our aspirations for a world into a reality. You see, the king we follow, who is Lord of all, has entrusted his love to us for the whole of creation. And the judgments he makes are those of love. Loving our neighbour, well, it's, it's not a remote exercise, but an entirely practical piece of care for the world and all its people. The words of the leaders have to be turned into the actions of people, and that, in the end, means us. The beginning is God. The end is God in Jesus, 
whose revelation says will judge the patients. And that's not just about judging the leaders either. He could be asking, how have we loved? How have we cared? Well, then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you, a stranger, invite you in, needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison or go to visit you? And the king replied, I truly tell you, whatever you did for one of these, the least of my brothers and sisters, you did for me. Thank you.